So we're about to start our eight, I think this is lecture number eight of the uh, Moro Nebuchim. And today is a very special day because we have a chance to begin the actual text of the Moro Nebuchim itself, as opposed to all of the various introductions and instructions and lead ups. And uh, so it's chapter, it's a uh, Part one, chapter one, is what we're going to begin with today. Before we start the, um, the uh, before the Rambam, in his usual way, before he begins a, a book or a chapter, he always quotes, uh, gives a, a biblical quote, which, which is a lead-in and a, to what he's, a, everything he's about to say. And this biblical quote he chooses to lead into the entire Sefer of Moro Nebuchim. So it's a very special one. And just like when he had th these quotes prior to the uh, introduction, I expounded a little bit on, on suggesting possible reasons why he chose that quote. I'm gonna do the same thing today. And uh, so it'll, I'll be a, a little bit of a, um, of a sermon here. So forgive me for that, but I think it's really important and it will help us really get a feel for what the Ramam is about to do in this book. He chooses one of, one of my favorite verses, uh, and the verse in the Hebrew, it's uh, from Isaiah, from Isaiah, uh, 26, verse 2. And it, this verse reads as follows, Pitchu she'arim, and I'm going to translate in a moment, V'yavo goi tzadik shomer emunim. One of the reasons why this verse is special to me is because in the shul that I grew up in, uh, or not, not so much grew up in, but I spent my many years of my youth in, in Baltimore, where the shul where my father was the rav. Uh, the the um the, over the our own kodesh, this verse was 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 written. The, the name of the shul was Shomre Amuna, so this verse was very appropriate. Pitrush Arim, literally, it means as follows: Open the gates, via Vogoy Tzadik, and may a righteous nation enter Shomer Emunim. The nation that keeps its its faith or keeps the truth, um, depending on exactly how you translate emunim. Now, if one were to look at the Ramam chooses this as the verse that to lead off the, his book, and um, I'm going to suggest a reason why. But beforehand, let's understand this verse. This is in uh, one of the parts of Isaiah where he is describing the idyllic future, and and uh, the, the verse that preceded that this one talks about by Omahu on that day, Yushar Hashir Hazed, this new song, this beautiful song will be sung at the Eretz Yehuda in the land of Judea. Ir Ozlanu, this city, the city of Jerusalem, is a strong city for us. Yeshua Yashit, it will, um, it, this, this city brings, brings salvation or brings victory to Chomot Vachel. Um, uh, and that becomes victory, becomes our wall and our strength and our extra wall. Uh, and then he says, Pitrusha Arim, open the gates, and may a righteous nation enter Shomer Munim, one that keeps the faith. Now, if you look at the classic traditional uh, com commentaries, for, or the medieval commentaries, if you could pick up a, a traditional Jewish Makro uh, Gedolo, you know, you'll find the, the commentaries, all of whom are medieval, virtually all of whom were after Maimonides' day. And they pretty much explain this verse in, in some form of the following way. Open the gates of Jerusalem. This is talking about the days of the Messiah. Open the gates of Jerusalem and may the righteous nation, meaning the nation of Israel, enter the nation that was Shomer Amunim, that kept the faith throughout all of the dark years of suffering. This nation kept the faith, opened the gates of Jerusalem, and welcomed that nation in. Now, when I read Isaiah myself, and again, this is a plug for my own podcast, it occurred to me that this not doesn't seem to me to be the proper translation of the Pasuk. And that's all my years uh, growing up in Shul. That's what I assumed it meant when I saw it in front of me when I was davening, because it was up there in the front, front wall, all nice engraved. I thought they open the gates of heaven and, and allow this faithful people, the Jewish people to come to, into the gates of heaven, so to speak. But actually what, what, what it occurred to me that what Ishayo, and I'm gonna say right now, what he really meant was pretty much the opposite of that. And what do I mean? What he really meant was to say 
that we, the people of Judea, just like he said in the prior verse, we are here. Our strength is not in walls, our strength, but our strength is, is the city of Jerusalem. So open the gates of Jerusalem so that any nation that is righteous and trustworthy and keeps trust can enter and come and join. And when you look at the context, this makes much more sense in the context of Yeshayahu, and it fits much more into all of, Yishai, all of Isaiah's visions of what the future means, the future where the entire world comes to Jerusalem. Now, this is what I thought, and this is what I knew, but when you look at the classic commentaries, they don't, that's not how they explain it. But, and, 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 but if you look, though, at the Sifra, which is if the, the earlier, um, uh, give me one second. Uh, if you look at actually how the rabbis, how the, the rabbis from Talmudic times, how they explained the verse, then you'll see something very different from that explanation. And you'll see that my initial understanding of Yishayo is was correct and was exactly what, what the what Yishaya had in mind, according to the rabbinic understanding. And that will lead us to understand why Maimonides specifically chose this verse to head off the book. And I'm going to read to you from the Sifra, which is one of the earliest uh, forms of Medrash, of Midrash, on the, on the verse. And it says, it reads as follows, Rabbi Yirmiya Omer, Rabbi Yirmiya used to say, Minayan Atta Omer, how do I know that one can say that Afilu Nachri, that even one who is a Gentile, and he lives his life according to the rules, dictates, and morals of the Torah, that that he has the same status as the high priest himself. Talmud Lomar, the Torah teaches us, that these rules of the Torah are those which will be done by a human being, and he shall live by that. And similarly, it says, and this is the Torah of humans, of people. Torah takoanim v'leviim v'Yisrael lo nemar. It does not say this is the Torah of the priests, Levites, and Israelites, but rather el Torah to Adam. And then another proof text Rabbi Yirmiyah brings. V'chein hu Omer. And similarly, it says pitchu sha'arim, open the gates via vo and may a righteous nation enter shomer onim, one who keeps the truth, one who is trustworthy and faithful. It doesn't say open the gates and the, the, the priests or the Levites or the Israelites shall enter. But rather it says, may it enter the Goitzadik, any nation that is righteous. And then uh, it brings a few more proof texts. And then in the end it says, from here we see that even a Gentile that keeps the Torah, so now the actual rabbinic understanding of the verse of Isaiah was exactly what I thought it was. But now it really makes sense to understand Maimonides. Because what some as we go through this book of Maimonides, there's a few things that will be glaring that will come out of the text. And one of the most important ideas is his very universalistic as opposed to particularistic understanding of Judaism. And that is this, that, that the... As long, any human being whose goal and objective is to seek the truth has the same access to the truth. That it doesn't matter if you're born a Jew or born, uh, you know, uh, uh, pick your nationality. Uh, uh, any human being that, that spends his or her life searching for the truth because it's the truth and lives a, a, a life of, of, of proper morals and ethics, that person has access to the higher intellect and the act, which is the intellect of, of, of the godly intellect. And um, therefore, it's, it's really, really a beautiful thing that Rambam chose the, this verse to lead off the book. And, and, uh, it, we, and it really sets the tone for everything we're about to study together. Pitchu sha'arim, the Rambam says, open the gates, there's two things you need to do to be, come into these gates. I'm opening these gates of wisdom to you. And number one, be righteous, live a righteous life. And number two, Shomer Munim, you have to be steadfast to the truth. You have to be steadfast and trustworthy. Now we can begin. The, my, if, if you look, um, you can follow along in the Friedlander. 
I am going to um, start in, uh, you know, I'm going to be using the Pines. It's chapter one. It's on Pines. It's page 21, uh, chapter one, uh, uh, part one, chapter one. So this part of, of the Rambam is, um, is, uh, is uh, he, he analyzes language and words. And it's very easy to get lost in, in thinking about this as a technical analysis of language. However, if you look at it that way, it can be very dry, it can be very boring, and you really miss the, the point. The point which is, which, and I'm gonna focus on, uh, on going farther than just uh, the meaning of the words and delve into how the Rambam really used these, his, his analysis of the word to understand the verses. And we're going to have so many chances to go back and look at verses, see the way Rambam read them, and, and, and find many, many beautiful ideas. So it starts off with this. The two words that Rambam is going to start off and analyzing are the words selem and demut. Selem is the Hebrew word usually translated as some sort of image, and demut is some sort of likeness. The languages of Tselem and Demut. Now, the reason why Ramam chooses these, this language is because those of us that are familiar with Genesis, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, I'm just going to read the two verses, uh, 21, uh, 26 and 27. Vayomer Elohim, and God said, Naase Adam bitzalmenu kitmutenu, let us create man in our Tselem, and according to our Demut, which could be translated as in our likeness and in our image. And he shall rule over, and exactly how to translate Yirdu or rule over is a subject of a different time, uh, discussion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the heaven and so on. And the next verse, God created the human being in his selem, in his image, with the image of God, uh, uh, baro, so he created him Zahon, Keva, male and female Baro, some he created them. So this this, this verse is um high is a very difficult verse to translate and deal with, and Ramam is about to deal with it, and let's see what he says. People have thought, now I'm reading in the pines, and I'm gonna, as my usual path, I'm gonna stop here and there and and uh, and comment. So people have thought that in the Hebrew language, the word image, selem denotes the shape and configuration of a thing. So a tselem being a form, you imagine the shape. It has uh, arms, legs, head, uh, a stomach, and so on and so forth. Um, this supposition led them to the pure doctrine of the corporeality of God. So they assumed right away when we read this verse that on account of his saying, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Kids menu, kid musenu, right? For they thought that God has a man's form. I mean, his shape and configuration, that God has the same shape. He has a head, he has arms, he has legs, and so on, just like a human being. The pure doctrine of the corporality of God was a necessary consequence to be accepted by them. The people that read it this way, they accordingly believed in it and deemed that if they abandoned this belief, that if you would say anything else, they would give the lie to all the biblical, to the biblical text. Then if you don't believe it, then, the, then, the, then you're not trusting the words of the text. You're not being true to the text that they would even make the deity to be nothing at all, unless they would, e according to the text, one might even think that God is really nothing more than just a human being, unless they thought that, uh, that in other words, if you deny that, you're denying God completely. So it must be God as a body provided with a face and a hand like them, just like they are they, as human beings in shape and configuration. However, he is in their view bigger and more resplendent than they themselves. And the matter of which he compo composed is not flesh and blood, some other matter. It's not, it's not flesh and blood like we are, but he's some other thing. But it basically looks like a man, just much bigger, much stronger, much more powerful, and all kinds of, of superpowers. So as they see it, this is as far as one can go in establishing the separateness of God from other things. When one says that God is different than human beings, he's different because he's bigger, he's better, he's more powerful, he's smarter, he knows more, all kinds of things like that. Now, um, so let's think for a moment of, about what the Ramam just said. There's really, I, I divide into two groups of people that, that the Ramam is really addressing. There are 
uh, and it's a, nowadays it would translate into an atheist, right? An atheist would look at the Bible and say that the Bible is creating an anthropomorphic God. They would understand it exactly as it says. They would, it, it wouldn't bother them because they don't believe in God anyway, right? And, um, and so they would just say, you see, this is what the Old Testament says God is, and this is how they believe God is to be. Or you can look at it from a, a on the other end of the spectrum as a, literal, a biblical literalist. I'm reading this verse, this is what the verse says, and this is what God is. Neither of those approaches are good for the perplexed person of Maimonides, the one who he's writing this book for, the one who believes in God, right? On the one hand is a religious man, but also believes in what he knows to be true based on science, philosophy, and, and logic. So, so this is, we're perplexed, right? How do we deal with this problem? So the Rambam is gonna say, just devote a few lines to stating, I'm not gonna bother proving to you now that God is not corporeal, right? I'll, we'll deal with that later. Why it's so important that God doesn't have a form of a human body is something I'll deal with later. Now, respect, I'll, I'll read his words. Respect to, with respect to that which ought to be said in order to refute the doctrine of corporality of God. In other words, to prove to you that God is not, maybe it's true, maybe it's true. No, uh, to, I'll prove that to you and to establish his real unity, which can have no true reality unless one disproves his corporeality, we, that, right? You shall know the demonstration of all this from the street. That I'll say later on in this book, we'll get to that. Why corporeality is, is such a bad idea. However, here now in this chapter, only an indication is given. I'm just telling you, God is not corporeal. Take that for granted, right? Uh, um, because I want to explain to you here how you look at the word of demut and selim, of, of image and likeness. So how is the Ramam going to deal with this? This is, um, so let's take a look at how he deals with this. So first, he employs the strategy of if I wanted to state that God, act, let's say it was true that there was a corporeal God. In other words, the Torah really wanted to teach us that God's form is the form of a human being. The Ramam says there are better Hebrew words that would absolutely describe it that way. And that word is toar. Now I say that in the Hebrew language, the proper term designating the form that is well known among the multitude, anyone that knows Hebrew knows, that if you want to actually describe the actual shape and, and like image of something, um, is toar, right? Is the word toar. Um, thus, scripture says, uh, and I'll read from the Hebrew so I have the verses in front of me. Um, one second. Um, Uh, he describes something and it's something is beautiful in form. Mataro, what is its form? Kitoar he has the, the look or the appearance of, 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 a, of a prince. And, and, and so on. So these are some examples that Ramam uses. He marks its form, he, he write, draws out the form with the line. He marks its form, Yitarehu. Um, with the compass, itareu. So it's specifically describing a form of a shape. It's the word toar. However, in contrast, so that's the first, but that's a light proof. In other words, if the Torah wanted to say that God had an image of a man, it would have described his toar, not his tselem. But the term tselem, the term image, on the other hand, is applied to, and I'm going to explain this outside for a second before I, I, I read his words. That is, is that the word selem refers to the essence that makes a thing special, that makes it it, right? What makes a human being a human being? And in Maimonidean philosophy, I'm going to tell you what he's going to say. That which makes a human being special as a human being is his intellect. That's what makes him unique. We're not different from animals in our selem. There's other animals that many animals virtually have almost the same form. They have two arms, two legs, a head, a mouth, a nose, et cetera, an eye. But, but what makes human a human is the special intellect that he has. So that is what Selim is, right? Selim refers to what makes a person a person. 
Now, sometimes what makes something a thing is its actual form, right? What makes a chair a chair is its shape, right? It's not the fact that, that it has wood or metal or whatever, right? It's the fact that it has a certain shape that allows you to sit on it, right? If you made, took that same material and you made a different shape, it would be a table or whatever, right? But for what makes a human being a human being, it's not his, his, his shape, but it is his, it is his intellect. So therefore, um, and so I'm going to read from the Ramam's words now, the term image on the other hand, the term salam is applied to the natural form. I mean to the notion in virtue of which a thing is constituted as a substance and becomes what it is. It is the true reality of the thing insofar as the latter is that particular being. In man, that notion is that from which human apprehension derives. Well, um, a human ability to understand things. It is on account of this intellectual apprehension that it is said of man in the image of God created he here. For this reason also it is said, thou, uh, okay, and this I'm going to bring, a, uh, this is a, he brings a verse from Tehillim from Psalms, which is interesting. It says Psalms 23. And in this, um, in this uh, uh, chapter of Psalms, the, uh, the writer, the one saying the Psalm is, um, is saying how he, most of his life, he looked at the people who were evil and prospering and they were enjoying their wonderful life. And he who was trying to live a righteous life is suffering the old question of theodicy. But then I realized, uh, one day I realized that, that, you know, uh, that, that their end um, is going to be, um, you know, that the, all of this fun that they're having now, one day um, is, going, is gonna be over. Right. In other words, the 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 uh, their objective, the ultimate aim and goal of their life is going to be ruined. So, and and at the end of that, it says the verse that God Himself, God, um, when um, when he God is awakened, he despises their image. He despises their teller. So the Rambam proves from here, what does it mean he despises their tela? It doesn't mean he despises their human form. Their human form is no different than anything else. He despises what makes them them. What makes them the cynical, arrogant people that were just being described. It's that quality that God hates, right? It's that quality that God despises. It's the quality of cynicism, the quality of arrogance, the quality of, of, of selfish pursuits, uh, and so on. So, but, so... So lest you think the Ramam says that my explanation of the word selim is just my own imagination and I'm just trying to use it to get away with it. No, you see clearly that the word selim is not referring to the form, but it's referring to the, um, to the, uh, to the essence, the, per the, the, the thing that makes a person a person. Um, for contempt, the, the Ramam says, has for its object the soul, which is the specific form not the shape and configuration of the parts of the body. And now the Ramam goes on to something else here, which is very interesting. Um, uh, there's another verse where the, Torah, where the word Selim is used. And here's a place where you can just see how applying Rambam's method, you end up with a completely different and in many cases deeper and much more um, meaningful understanding of the verse than would be otherwise. And this is going in the story of in, in Shmuel Aleph in the book of Samuel 1. And uh, this was at the time in history when the Philistines had captured in battle the, the Ark, the Ark of the Covenant, the Aron Kodesh. And the Aron Kodesh, as it, went, as it was being held in captivity, was causing the people holding it all kinds of suffering. It eventually ended in the, ended, landed in the Philistine camp. And they were suffering with Tichorim. Tuchorim, which is generally translated as hemorrhoids, that everyone was suffering from terrible hemorrhoids. Now, um, and they're also suffering from a plague of mice that were attacking the fields and eating the, the crops. And they attributed it to the fact that they were holding the Aron Kodesh um, hostage and they wanted to give it back. So, so the people went to their, um, to their, uh, to their uh, leaders, their seers, their spiritual head, uh, uh, leaders who said, they said, how can we get rid of this, all this suffering? We need it. We we must need to give the ark back. And they tell them, give them the following instructions: Va'asitem salmei tichorechem. Make and I'm going to translate literally and translate the way most translations understand this verse. This is uh, one Samuel chapter six, verse five. 
you should make salme forms of tzichol rechem, literally of your hemorrhoids, but salme and forms ach berechem of your mice, hamashchitim esaret, which are destroying the land, and then uh, uh, presumably make them like out of gold or something, out of something precious. Unitzatem lelohei Yisrael kavod, and give those as gifts to the God of Israel. Ulai yokelet yadome alechem, maybe he will um, lighten up his punishments from upon you, umi al elohechem, and the punishments that he's meeting out against your God, your religion, umi al and against your land. So the simple understanding of this verse is they were instructed to make forms of their of, of the uh, of their hemorrhoids and forms of mice and give them as gifts to 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 the God's temple to the temple of Israel. You know, the Rambam says, and I'm going to read a, a couple of, uh, sentences, and I'm you're going to see how he understands this completely differently. The word salme here, the Rambam says, can't possibly mean make forms of the hemorrhoids, which is, it's it's hard to say. It's uh, something will make you laugh, right? But it just sounds silly. I assert, the Rambam says, that the reason why idols in general, often we find the word selem referring to an idol, right? We find that throughout the Torah. But it's not because the idol is a form, but rather it lies in the fact that was sought in them was the notion that was deemed to subsist in them. In other words, when they looked at the idol, they thought that this idol stood for something, that there was some essence behind it, which is why they called them a selem. You can have a form in your house that has no meaning, that's not a God. You can have a form in the temple that has meaning and is a God. So the form in the temple, they called it selah. I assert similarly with regard to the scriptural expression, images of your hemorrhoids, right? Um, for what was it? So what does this mean? When the Rambam says, and I'm going to read to you the verse now, according to the way Rambam reads this verse. They were instructed and told by their spiritual leaders, Ba'asitem tzalmei tzichorechem doesn't mean make forms of your hemorrhoids. It means you should make and think, in other words, think about the, the essence of why you're suffering. And think about the essence of why the mice are, are, are attacking your field. In other words, look into your behavior. Look into what it is, why it is that you're suffering. And, and, and why it is that you're, and then unitatem lelohei Yisrael kavod, then you can give honor to the God of Israel. How much more stunningly beautiful is that possible when you read it the way Rambam reads it, than when you read it as if they were told to make, make golden forms and donate them to the temple. There, it's, it's astounding how much more beautiful it becomes, something which seemed, which seemed like a, a very odd verse to begin with, all of a sudden is they're being encouraged to have a spiritual awakening for what was intended by them was the notion of warding off the harm caused by the hemorrhoids and not the shape of the hemorrhoids. They weren't making shapes, right? The idea was, is what's the cause? What's the idea? What's the reason? Then with them come over. But then the Rambam goes ahead and says, well, but let's say you don't like my explanation of the verse. And you say, no, it says, I see them. You should make the shapes, the forms, and it really means the form. Well, I could still answer that because if, however, there should be no doubt concerning the expressions of the images and images being used in order to denote you know, shape and configuration, like let's say you decided that in that particular verse, it actually means the shape and configuration, then it would follow. I would explain it. If you remember, Rambam, the first thing he said, right, in the beginning of the introduction was there's different words can often have several meanings. You can have, and he, he talked about equivocal terms, derivative terms, and amphibolous terms. All right, equivocal and amphibolous terms were words that had many meanings or words that have, that it's unclear what their meaning is and can mean different things depending on the context. So it would then follow that the image, the word image is an equivocal or an amphibolous term applied to the specific form and also to the artificial form and to what is analogous to the two in shapes and configurations of the natural bodies. So, um, so now that so let's so in other words, so I can still say my, what I'm telling you because I showed you that other places the word selam means the essence and not the actual physical shape. That which to therefore that which was meant in the scriptural dictum in the word, let us make man in our image. Now I said Adam bit salmenu was the specific form was was the meaning of the term in its specific meaning, which is like Ramam said, its essence, which is intellectual apprehension, not the shape and configuration. So we have now explained to you the difference between image and form. 
and have explained the meaning of the word image. I, in other words, the difference between the word selem and the word toar. Toar meaning the, the physical form of things, selem meaning the essence, that which makes something special, that which makes it it. Now, the second term, as for the term likeness, um, it is a noun derived from the verb uh, dome, to be like, right? So it says, let's make it in our image and in our likeness. There, the Ramam says, I really have a lot to stand on because when I say our likeness, what does it mean when you say dome, something is compared to, is like something else, right? It too signifies likeness in respect of a notion. A human being is like the angels, is like God in a certain sense, in a certain way. For the scriptural dictum, I am, and he's going to bring different examples. I am like a pelican in the wilderness. Does not signify that its author resembled the pelican. And no one thinks that it means that I am like that bird, right? In other words, that I have wings and fly like the pelican. Of course not. Um, with regard to its wings and feathers. But he means that I am sad, like the sadness of the bird. In the same way, it says, nor was any tree in the garden of God like it un unto it in beauty. No tree was dome that was like it, that like that one. Um, uh, or the likeness in respect to the notion of beauty. It's trying to say that this tree is the, nothing was similar to it. Nothing could be compared in the sense that nothing was as beautiful. Or their venom is the likeness of the venom. Or his likeness is that of a lion and eager to tear it to pieces, so on and so forth. He brings all these examples. So they refer to uh, both of them to a likeness in respect of a notion, not with respect to a shape and a configuration. In the same way, it is said the likeness of a throne, right? The likeness being referred to its elevation, its sublimity, its, 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 its special grandeur, not in respect to the throne square shape, how solid it is, how long its legs are, as some stupid people think, as wretched people think in Pine's words, right? So a similar explanation could be applied to the expression, the likeness of the living creatures. So now, so after the Ramam just showered us with proof after proof after proof that kidmutenu, likeness does not, does not mean the shape. Now he can come and explain to us what it means. Now man possesses as his propria. What does a man have that makes him man, that makes him special? Something in him that is very strange as it is not found in anything else that exists under the sphere of the moon. Nothing on this level of existence on this planet resembles a human being. Now, nowadays we might see more and more little bits of self-awareness in certain animals, but, but in the Rambam's mind, and even today, there's something that makes a human being in terms of the intellect, a step above. And what is that? That is intellectual apprehension. And the exercise of this, no sense, no part of the body, none of the extremities are used. We might, with modern science, say this is different than other, because now when we we can actually measure thoughts as they bounce around through the neurons in our brain. So there actually are physical manifestations of our thoughts. But, but in the Rambam's day in his science, he understood it being as pure, the intellect as being purely of the soul. So when a person's mind is thinking, that mind is purely devoid of a physical component. And therefore this apprehension was likened unto the apprehension of the deity. In that sense, it is similar to that which God apprehends which does not require an instrument because God also doesn't have any physical manifestation of whatever it is that God thinks, whatever that even means, right? There's no physical instruments associated with it. Although in reality, it is not like that. In actuality, don't think for a minute that God's thought, even using the word thought doesn't apply, is similar to our thought, but it appears to be so to the first stirrings of phenomena. When you first think about it, there's a comparison you can, you can compare. It is because of this something, I mean, because of the divine intellect conjoined with man, that, that a human being has this divine intellect within him, that it is said that he is in the image of God and in his likeness, not that God, may he be exalted, is a body and possesses a shape. So here we have um, the Rambam explaining to us how to read the, um, the, the, uh, the psukim, um, how to read, what does it mean? I, I, I wish I had longer because I wanted to go to chapter two because chapter two, which we're going to do next week is, I mean, today was beautiful too, but chapter two, and I'm going to give you a little uh, uh, preview, talks about the sin of eating of the tree of knowledge and, and how Maimonides understands that sin. And he takes, 
what, what exactly did human beings get when they got the knowledge of good and evil? Um, and and it's, 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 it's the next chapter is stunning and you'll never read voracious again the same way once you read Maimonides' explanation. But, but I just, I'm saying that now to hopefully whet your appetite for next week. But uh, I'm going to stop here um, and ask if anyone has questions or comments on today's. Alec. I would uh, ask a question. You, you, um, you use the term Tselem, Demut, and Toar. Could you, could you perhaps write out a lengthier um, definition so that we could really keep the distinctions between those terms in, in front of us when we're, we're, we're reading? Not, um, if you can't, and if it's too much work, that's, that's fine. I, I think I got it, but um, I, I just uh, thought it would be easier to. Uh, yeah, I, it's, 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 uh, we would have to write a, a pre guide to the perplexed translation Selim, I would translate as image, demus as likeness, and toar as 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 form or shape, right? And um, and then a post uh, guide for the perplexed uh, translation, which would be Selim, meaning the the essence, uh, demut as as a comparison of some sort. I had to think of a better word, and toar as the same thing as a form or a shape. But um, you know. Uh, that would be how I would have to say it. But if someone else has a better handle on language than I do, might be able to do a better job with it. And any other uh, comments, questions? I would say I, I, I'll, I'll pick up the point. I mean, okay. uh, the, f right from the opening quote of part one. Mm -hmm. uh, Open ye the gates. Yes. Would you would you give us a, another translation uh, for that that we could? Um, I I didn't get a chance to write it down, but I mean the the one that is in your opinion, the the proper translation. Okay. Well, pitru she'arim, open the gates. Viavo and may the righteous, and may. A righteous nation enter, Shomer Emunim, one who um, seeks the truth. The uh, the the last one seeks the truth was is 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 some of the translations actually say that um, or that keeps faithfulness, but uh, but I, I I take seek the truth as the better one. I think the the first JPS translation of the Torah. The original Jewish Publication Society one from the early 20th century translate it seeks the truth like I did. I have to look that up, but I'm pretty sure they did. Okay. Thank you. I have, a, I have a very prosaic question. Yes. We, we had a different link for tonight's class. Are we going to continue using that different link for future yes. classes, or do we go back to the old one? No, continue using the new one. And I have to. I don't know why, but when I, I'm in Zoom, it only lets me schedule seven lectures in a row. So I did seven, and then I had to, I must, there must be a better way to do this. I just don't know what it is, but I'll figure it out. And, and I wanted to just do, I tried to do the same thing again for another seven, but it didn't let me and it made a new link. So I, I don't know, I was doing something wrong. I had to say, that's my technical uh, lack of expertise, I guess. I'm sorry about that, but yes, this the one that you use today will be the same one we use next week. And I apologize for the confusion in the beginning. No problem. Thank you. Next week, will we be doing chapter two? Yes, we're just going to continue straight, oh, and we're going to we're going to learn how Rambam understands the sin of the eight sadat. Okay. Um, uh, the, it's it's going to be fun of the tree of knowledge. Oh, you use the term. If nobody else has any questions, I'll just continue right. talking. He used the term intellect uh, as uh, what distinguishes humans from uh -huh. uh, lower forms of animals. Um, yes. But intellect is a kind of a, a high level term. Uh, can you 
in 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 philosophy can you can you I, I would say this is my, my myself talking that what, what distinguishes us from lower animals is that we are able to reason and uh, I'm not sure if intellect includes that or intellect includes things like memory and and other other attributes too. Um, based on the, yeah, I'm sorry. Based on the language that Ramam uses, it's it's to him it seems like a, more comprehension and understanding, and um and which requires reason in order to understand. You know so, um yeah. Go ahead. Could I? I know that back in Rambam's time, it wasn't popular to think about these sorts of things. But let's take a human being who was born with a flawed intellect. Um, let's assume we're talking about a, a child born with Down syndrome, um, who has a less developed intellect than perhaps even some forms of non-human animals. Um, but my guess is that Rambam would view that child born with Down syndrome, although obviously I didn't know what it was, to still be in the image of God, that there was something connecting him to God, some essence, even though that person really does not have a developed intellect. Now, am I just imposing my sort of modern values on Rambam? Yeah, I mean, to some extent, yes. To some extent, not. I mean, I think Rambam would have thought of, of, of human beings of lesser intellect as somehow less, still human, and still important to, to grant them the, uh, the privileges that, uh, that granted to human beings, in other words, that, that we need to respect them, take care of them, et cetera. But I think he, uh, he, he, there will be places in, in, the, in this book that he, you'll get the, you'll get the feeling that a per person of lower intellect is somehow less. So th there is a, there is a, uh, there are certain underlying things in, in rap, you know, I, I love to emphasize the parts of what Maimonides thought that speak to us today, but there are parts of Maimonides thought that, that will, um, will kind of grade on our modern sensibilities. And this is one of them, but, um, but we'll see as we go through it and it'll come to a conclusion yourself, but that's my, that's my short answer. Any other comments? I want. I do want to leave the, that with the the Ramam's analysis of the pasuk and Shmuel about the forms of the the forms of the uh, hemorrhoids as 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 something which took an extremely silly and sounding and difficult verse and and made it into something with a very deep idea um, is is really the value is one of the major values of Rambam's approach. And I, you could have just, I could have just read past it. And I was, I was talking in, in the beginning of this uh, to Steve about this uh, and right before the lecture started that, that, you know, you could just read past it and say, oh, that's, that's his proof of this. But if you go to Shmuel and look at it and then you say, wow, if you read it the way Rambam is reading it, it really, it, it, it takes this text and makes it make sense. And it's so true with so much of what we read when, as we go through this book. And I want you to pay attention to that, that using Rambam's method and his way of, of reading the Torah, so many things that you look at and are either questionable or difficult or seem to be almost meaningless, the questions all of a sudden, they shine, they, they light up and they're no longer questions. And that's really the guide to the perplexed. So until now, when you learn Shmuel, right, th those verses were kind of perplexing and weird sounding. All of a sudden now, he just got, he just deperplexed us. <laughs> he, he made that verse into something that meant something. And, uh, and I think we, you'll find that all happen over and over and over again as we go through the book. So um, if there's no other questions, I'll call it a day and we'll, uh, we'll see everybody again same time next week. Are we good? All right. Have a wonderful week. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.